This episode is brought to you by Indie Film Hustle Academy, where filmmakers and screenwriters go to learn from top Hollywood industry professionals. Learn more at ifhacademy.com. I'd like to welcome to the show, Neil Bloomcat, man. How you doing, Neil? Good. How's it going? Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for being on the show, man. I am a huge fan of yours, uh, you know, ever since District 9 and and also the mythical story behind the short and how it became the feature and then this whirlwind that you went on. And we're going to kind of talk about all that. But first of all, how did you get started in the business? I suppose... The, I suppose it was through visual effects and animation, really, uh, but it was always as a stepping stone towards directing. So, um, you know, when I when I when I was living in South Africa as a teenager, I I always was very drawn to film, but I I wasn't really sure whether I would be able to work in film or or no, actually, I should I should qualify that I I was it didn't even occur to me that I could have a career in film. Yeah. So it was when I moved to Canada at 18 and I realized I could actually work in the film industry. Um, and there was, uh, there was a visual effects company that I started working for as an animator. And uh, pretty much from the time I started there, I was looking at a lot of my favorite directors having gone through commercials and music videos before right. becoming feature directors. And so I thought that that would be, a, that would be an interesting path to try to... Um, you know, to try out. And, and that is kind of what I ended up doing. I just spent very little time in the world of, of commercials before getting into features. So, but I, yeah, that was, that was the, the sequence of events. Now how, and, and those, those directors, cause I came up around the same time you did and I was following, I got into the commercial world and directed commercials and stuff. And I, I mean, I was the same thing during that time period, commercials mm -hmm. was see it seemed to be a gateway in it was one of the yeah. one of the paths that you can get in it so still is i mean it, you know to a certain yeah. yeah absolutely but i think it was the first time i think obviously ridley and tony scott were the ones who kind of busted open the doors with commercial directors getting into features but uh who were those directors that who you were looking up to i'd love to hear th those uh those names well, actually, I mean, RSA, RSA ended up signing me. So right. that was because of Ridley and because of Tony that it felt like that was that was a good way to go. But really, the, the actually the more famous company was Propaganda Films, right? Of course, Steve, of course. Steve Golan. Mm -hmm. And like what Steve Golan was doing with people like David Fincher, I mean, millions of, of directors were coming out of Propaganda Films. Oh, I, uh. um, it, it's it's like unbelievable um, from, you know, Adrian Line to Dominic Senna to Fincher to Michael Bay, Bay like Spike Jones, uh, Antoine Fuqua, yeah. the list goes on and on. Yeah, Fuqua, exactly. So, and, um, but I mean, Ridley with RSA was, you know, was, was, it, it was weird because they, Tony and Ridley were the ones directing the movies and then the, the commercial directors in RSA, I, it's hard to think of RSA directors that went on to do features at that time. Right. Um, but it was like, as the owners of the company, they were the ones who were doing it. And then a propaganda, all the directors were moving into from commercials and music videos into film. So it just, it just seemed like a very, um, like a very good path to go on. And I did, I did this like completely insane short film about this, this, uh, bipedal robot <clears throat> in Africa right. that Wyden and Kennedy watched which is the company that does uh nike's advertising and i was like really super lucky because um one of the executives at the company mark fitzloff saw that piece and then had me direct um a really low budget small nike piece uh and then the next nike piece that i did was was massive it was a super bowl commercial oh. um Nice. with like you know an absolutely insane budget <laughs> and uh and then it was shelved it was like nike told me that if anybody ever saw it i'd get into you know legal trouble with them which is pretty hilarious but 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 i i went through that process quite quickly of like you know direct directing commercials and getting uh, a certain amount of like notoriety behind them because Wyden and Kennedy was so well known. So I, I owe Fitzloff a lot for that. And, and, but I just have to ask, why did they shelve it? What was the problem with it? I mean, if you, I mean, I've never heard of that. I mean, I heard, I've heard yeah. of that a little bit, but not that at that level. 
I think I think there were two things happening simultaneously. Like the one thing was I I'm not totally sure about this, but I think that Nike went through. Um, I think it was at the time that Phil Knight was stepping down and someone else was replacing him, and there was like a change of regime regime change. Yeah, and and uh, and then also the ad itself was very. I think it was. I don't know if aggressive is the right word, but it was. It was a little bit different for what Nike normally was doing. So it was a combination of those two things. Got it. Got it. Now I, I also came in, I also came up in post-production uh, more on the editing and color grading and post supervising side. I did do some VFX stuff as well, but you came in through VFX working on some cool shows like dark angel. I remember dark angel and mm -hmm. all that stuff. What are the lessons that you brought from post-production into your directing? hard to say i mean i guess maybe i honestly i don't know i don't know because I, I i i think i think that the way that i think about doing visual effects isn't necessarily something that i brought with me from post-production to directing mm -hmm. i think it's more like that's an artistic style mm -hmm. that would have been there regardless of you know so it's 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 hard to say i mean i don't know I, I mean, know. I think, I think, I think, in your work, from my point of view at least, the line between visual effects and story are so blurred, as opposed to it's just incorporated so heavily in the storytelling process that it's it just is, as opposed mm -hmm. to we need a transforming robot. <laughs> uh, can we throw one in there? Mm -hmm. It's not, it's, you know, it's a, it's a little bit different the way you did it. So I understand what, you, but but from at least from my point of view, post production, at least when I'm on set. I know what I can do in post-production, hence helping me move a little faster on set. And I'm assuming that helps you as well. Right. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I think that as time has gone on, I've definitely tried to shed everything and just only look at it from the point of view of directing and, and kind of, I mean, I suppose you're, besides, besides trying to make something um, compelling with, with actors and cinematography, the only other thing that you have to do at the, you know, it's not blow the budget or blow your days really. So I, you know what I mean? So it's like, yeah. as long as you're, as long as you're doing, um, as best as you can creatively, uh, it, I mean, that's all that really matters. And I, I, I don't know how much of it is influenced by that background. I mean, it's an interesting question, but mm -hmm. when, when I, when I think of, uh, when I think of VFX, it's, it's no different than mechanical effects or, or prosthetics, mm -hmm. um, or wardrobe really, or makeup. It's, it's, it's just another tool that's there to help flesh out the scale of the world. It's just a, a lot of, a lot of, um, the fantastical elements tend to rely on VFX to a greater degree because they can do more. Right. Um, but it's like, you know, it's your job to try to convince the audience that that stuff is real <laughs> and the world that they're existing in for the duration of the movie is real. Now, where did you um, come up with the idea for District 9 and how did that whole little short get put mm -hmm. together? Well, I, you know, it's, it's, it's weird because when I lived in South Africa, um, I... I mean, I was obsessed with movies like Blade Runner, obviously, and mm -hmm. and and films that that had this kind of cyberpunk um, feel to them. And uh, in South Africa, you can only get your driver's license at 18, but you can get a motorbike license at 16. So, I had I had a bike where I would just ride through the streets of of downtown Joburg, which is, you know, relatively cyberpunk on its own. And I started realizing that I was, like. A lot of South African directors or South Africans in general that are creative tend to, or anywhere in the world really, tends to look at the U.S. as like a, the sort of the the, you know the, the creative um, landmark or or uh, sort of the milestone that you're going after, right? Like you wouldn't you wouldn't set something in your in your backyard necessarily if you're from South Africa or or Australia. You'd mm. you try to you try to emulate some sort of New York or LA sort of feel to things. And I started noticing that I was very interested in this city that I'd grown up in as I got older. And when I moved to Canada at 18, I, I realized I was really, really interested in it. And so every trip back, like besides besides seeing family, I was also seeking out parts of Johannesburg and South Africa's history that I hadn't really gone into much when I lived there. Um, and one of the things that started that I started becoming aware of was this feeling among relatively poor South Africans that 
that immigrants from Mozambique and um, Nigeria and Malawi were taking jobs, perce- were, uh, they were perceiving them as taking jobs from, from them. And uh, there was this like wave of, of illegal and legal immigration into South Africa. And so initially, the short, the short film that I did was, was real South Africans talking about real um, illegal aliens. Uh, and and be- when you mix that with having an interest in science fiction, but then also being interested in the sociopolitical stuff, it kind of – I turned it into the idea that the aliens were in fact actually aliens. But the performances, but they weren't performances. The documentary-based realism of what I was, I was, you know, interviewing people and what they were saying was based completely in in reality. So that that short was this kind of strange combination of uh, of of real documentary filmmaking mixed with science fiction. Which did you, did you add the science fiction afterwards, or was that all planned? Yeah. It was all planned when you were doing it. It was it, it was planned, yeah, it was planned. But it was it was it, the idea came from speaking to to South Africans. Like, I mean, if you you know if you live in Johannesburg, the the, the sort of north of the city would be um, wealthier, and then when you get in when you go beyond downtown, you'd get into Soweto or areas within Soweto or other townships townships like Timbisa or you know there's a whole bunch of them, and. Uh, those areas, I just didn't. I didn't spend much time in those areas when I lived there. And when you go into them and you start actually speaking to people, it just it, it it's sort of like a different. It's a different point of view of of things. And it started to it started to merge with some of the science fiction ideas that I was having. Where at the time I was really interested about using science fiction in in socio political or or uh, just discussions about culture and uh, you know economic stratification across classes class warfare mm-hmm. um, and I think all of those topics are kind of inescapable if you it, they, they, they reside in your mind a lot if, if you're if you come from a country like like South Africa you know or, or India or Brazil uh, where there's huge wealth inequality and huge different class stratification so yeah I, I guess it's almost like two pieces of two things that are interesting. Like one is just the the filmmaker kid interested in Blade Runner, and then the other one is is more of a a look at the culture that I had come from, and the the short film was a sort of a merging of those two things. But then in the space between making the film and making District Nine, I started to become more interested in 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 the nineteen eighties. Um, I mean, apartheid you know is much longer than obviously just the nineteen eighties, but the eighties is what I lived through. Up until uh, basically either 1990, the early, very early 90s when Mandela was released, or 1994 when the the ANC actually took over, when Mandela's uh, government actually took over. So I was 14 when the government switched. Um, so in the period between making the short and then District Nine, I had kind of moved away from the idea of illegal immigrants in South Africa with how how. Um, Native South Africans were perceiving them, and moved into an interest of just the, his, the entire history of of apartheid, and specifically the the 1980s, because South Africa was also fighting the the border war over the same period where they were fighting um, Angolans that were supported by Russia and by Cuba. It's weird. Like South Africa went to war with 50,000 Cubans in Angola. That's insane. I'm Cuban, yeah. so that's insane. <laughs> yeah, I've yeah, never yeah, heard, yeah, I've never even heard of that. Yeah, you probably there probably be people um, in you know far enough into your family history that may have been involved in that somehow because Fidel sent fifty to sixty thousand Cuban troops to Africa. So what 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 was happening was was the the perceived threat of communism was was pushing down Africa um, because Moscow eventually actually wanted the Cape from South Africa as a, like obviously as a strategic point in the, in the, at the height of the Cold War. Um, so they were building bases and 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 turning a lot of African countries communist on the way down to putting pressure on South, on South Africa, which despite apartheid was a massive ally of the US. And and so in it, it boiled over it started to get kind of crazy in the late sixties and then in the seventies they went to war with one another. And it just it just continued in this upward um, intensity uh, where the nineteen eighties was was, you know, just it was like completely intense through all the way through the through the eighties and it ended in, in nineteen eighty nine. The conflict ended. 
but that there was so South Africa had this weird um, mixture of m- militarization outside of the country um, fighting a war, and then it was using some of those tools within the borders to control uh, anti-apartheid, you know, pro pro-black movements that were happening within the country over the same period of time. Uh, but yeah, it was it was you know pieces of Angola had become communist, and they were they were basically fighting over Namibia, and and at the time South Africa controlled Namibia, <clears throat> and so as the Angolans pushed down, South Africa pushed up, and then um, and and the more pressure they put on Angola, Russia started to put started to use Cuba essentially as as a as a communist ally to to funnel um, troops into Angola to push the South Africans back down. So at That's its awesome. height, it was like 60,000 60, Cubans Jesus and uh, tons and tons of Russian, um, like Russian generals and Russian advisors that were, that were fighting with the Cubans and the Angolans against the South Africans. Jesus, man. Well, mm-hmm. so with, with the short um, and the feature, it was the first time, I mean, I was raised here in the States all my life. So it was the first time I'd seen kind of like this bigger budget action sci-fi film not set in the United States. It was kind of mm-hmm. mind it was kind of mind blowing. Uh yeah. especially the short. You were like, wow man, this was it, it just I think when the short came out, it, it kind of it was in two thousand four, two thousand five, if I'm not mistaken, and the internet was you know Yeah, it would YouTube, have been 05. Yeah, 05. And YouTube was YouTube was just getting started. How I don't did, even remember if it was on YouTube. I think it may not have been because I, th- I think YouTube yeah. didn't exist. Not, I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not actually sure. I don't I'm pretty think sure it, that, I yeah, don't I'm think it, sure it didn't exist. I don't yeah. think it, I think 2005, it launched, I think, in February of 2005 because I put some stuff up in August in 2005 mm. with my films. Um, but what? Um, how did it get into the hands of Peter Jackson who you know eventually helped you get the feature made? That was um, because of of RSA. So, like I was saying earlier, I joined RSA with an eye to getting into feature films. I only really cared about filmmaking, mm-hmm. like features. I, I never never really wanted to do commercials. So, um, when when I signed with RSA, uh, Jules Daly ran the commercial division, and I told her exactly what I wanted to do. And so now, all of a sudden, I was in a production company that had signed me that was you know, that it was well known and had, had a lot of creative, um, force behind it. And so she, she was like, let me introduce you to a bunch of agents, um, because you're going to need an agent, uh, to, you know, start directing films. So I was like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And so I met, I met a few agents that she put me in contact with that I really just didn't like at all. And then, uh, she was like, listen, there's one more agent that you should meet, but he's like way more unusual than the other ones. And, um, and, and he's, 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 you know, he's down to meet with you. And at the time I didn't realize how much of, how much, how much of a massive beneficial leg up this would be. But the agent was Ari Emanuel who, oh, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. I mean, Ari's, Ari's well, very well known in Hollywood. Yeah. So. Yeah. And I, when I met him, I really liked him. I liked how honest and just, I, I really, really loved him from the, the minute that I met him. And so uh, I think at the time it was Endeavor, it wasn't WME, but Endeavor signed me. And the second that, that Ari and Endeavor signed me, and then there was a younger agent at the time, um, who's, you know, he's my age now, uh, Phil Damacor. Those guys put my work in front of Mary Parent, who was producing Halo at universal and she was producing it with pete so she gave pete all of the stuff and she was like you should check out neil's stuff this is like a you know a young commercial director and and then pete was into it so i flew down to new zealand and met him and met the team that was assembled to do halo like you know everyone at weta and weta digital um and i just moved there with my family and started working on halo but but I, I did have a it was interesting because I kind of had a discussion with myself beforehand about I mean before before anything to do with Halo came up I I, I had a pretty firm idea because I had already made an Alive in Joburg which we were just speaking mm-hmm. about and I had a pretty firm idea of wanting to only do things that were kind of my own ideas or I liked the weirdness of of what Alive in Joburg had turned out to be and I mm-hmm. felt like that felt like me and I wanted to make films that were like that 
so I didn't want to do the Spider Mans and you know the the, the the Hollywood stuff. I just didn't want to really do it, and I was incredibly aware of that. Like it wasn't like a small thought. It was it was a strategic. I mean, well, it's anti-strategic because you're shooting yourself in the foot. But it was it was incredibly clear to me that that is not what I wanted to do, and. And then I was in New York, and I got this call where uh, Endeavor was like, "Peter Jackson wants to meet you for Halo." And I was like, "Fuck it, I'm doing it. I'm going to New Zealand." <laughs> like I was like instantly just threw it out. I didn't care, uh, which was pretty funny. Um, it was like testing, you know, testing the theoretical mental model. Um, it which, was put to the test, and it failed which, miserably. It failed completely it miserably. Absolutely fucking bottomed out. So. Yeah, and the second I got there, it was it was reinforced with how much of a brilliant decision it was because of just you know how amazing Weta was, and yeah. I'd never re- I, 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 the the world that Peter had created um, for himself as sort of a creative uh, you know structure around him was just so it was just really cool. So I started working on Halo, and uh, I was like, you know. In, very heavily invested in it um, for six or seven or eight months until Universal and Fox just collapsed the whole process and the film, um, that particular incarnation of the film died. And then and then Pete said, uh, hey, let's make District 9. I'll, I'll help you produce it. Well, what happened was um, I think there were at least 50, if not 60 or 70 people that were on payroll on Halo, right? And we'd spent a bunch of money building stuff and you know, we had a few different writers that we were working with. And the second that that collapsed, I was there with my wife and young daughter, and we'd been living there for well over half a year. She was in school in New Zealand. And it was like, well, okay, I guess I'm packing my bags and leaving. And I think Peter and Fran Walsh uh, were both, they both felt that it was, it was sort of, it was just a terrible ending to the way that all of the work that we had put into Halo had happened. And they, and they said, what, what else do you want to do? Is there something else you want to do? And I think it was actually Fran that suggested doing a live in Joburg into a feature. And by, it was literally like in the morning, the film collapsed. And in the afternoon, uh, we were working on what would become district nine. So then, yeah. So then everyone, uh, you know, like the crew diminished to like, basically my assistant, Victoria, um, Everybody else, like there was just nothing really to do, and then and then as we started slowly writing it and conceptualizing the movie, then Weta Workshop came back on board and started designing the creatures and and the world, and I went to South Africa a bunch of times to sort of, you know, fr- from a writing perspective, but also to shoot tests of certain things, and one of the tests that I shot was with Shalto, who, who hadn't acted in anything, but. And I wasn't putting him forward as the actor for the movie. I was trying to show Peter and Fran what this South African bureaucrat might look like, because I knew that he would be really good at at just bringing that kind of thing to life. But he was so convincing that it felt like we should just put this guy in the lead of the movie. And because because everything was um, sort of really happening only with Peter and Fran, and there was no... There was no typical studio structure to how we were doing things. We could make creative choices that were that crazy. Yeah, because I mean, you normally don't put a no-name actor no, without any bankable, you know, anything or in, in the lead well, of a, it, a sci-fi it, like that. It, it's not even that he that it was a no-name actor. So he wasn't an actor. Even the, even <laughs> again, he, he, taking right, it to another yeah. level. <laughs> he was more like. Uh, Sasha Baron Cohen in the way that like he would mess with people he would he he wanted to he well not wanted to be Shaw was a a sort of um, he was very much a filmmaker behind the camera but he would do he would do things that were more like uh, more like Sasha Cohen like skits that he would Mm -hmm. be doing in front of the camera where he'd be manipulating people and and it was that level of manipulation and improvisation that I always knew him as, as my friend in South Africa, that I knew if I explained what this character was, he would just pull it off amazingly for a test for us to then later get some other actor. But he was so convincing that it was like, let's just use Shalto. And that's that's what happened. So then so then the movie gets released. It you know, it explodes around the world. People love it. You get nominated for for a handful of Oscars. What is it like being in the center of that that kind of whirlwind, that that, that hurricane 
uh, because it's it's intense. I've spoken to others who have been in that in that little eye of the storm. Mm -hmm. it, it, what was it like? How did you handle it? What was that all about? I mean, I definitely was aware of the fact that I felt very very lucky that things had turned out that way. Um, you know, you you never you never really know how something is going to be, especially especially when it's a little bit weird. I mean, yeah. obviously, if you do if you make films that are a bit more um, generic that could be economically very profitable by by being very predictable and that fit between the rails perfectly um the the outcome may be more more predictable but with something like that i mean it's obviously highly unpredictable i, I remember when we were filming it i remember absolutely clearly thinking to myself like i know that i like this movie <laughs> and i know that if i was an audience member watching this i would like it so i'm going to assume that there is at least a small number of people that would be like me that would like this. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, I cannot really imagine other people liking it or not liking it. It's 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 absolutely in, unclear to me. Like South African setting, um, right. you know, political statements and political concepts wrapped in science fiction. It just, it just didn't, uh, it wasn't clear to me. So I, I know that when it was received well, I felt very, I felt lucky, you know, like that, that okay, like good, it turned out in a way that, that people liked it. You got you got the puck through the through the net, if you will. Yeah, <laughs> you just sneaked it through, uh, and yeah. that's that's always amazing when I see films like District Nine and, and many of your other films that have a budget, that have the scope of story, and you're either either able to work within a studio system or at least get it made. It's so much more interesting than the kind of mm. homogenistic things that come out of Hollywood. And I enjoy you know I enjoy some of the superhero movies and things like that. But at a certain point you'd like to have something with a little little meat to it. And District Nine has a lot of meat to it. There's a mm. lot of stuff. You're saying a lot of stuff. It's not just aliens mm -hmm. fighting, you know, you know, you know, shooting around and killing people and stuff. It it definitely says something. So mm. uh, I always find it so interesting. And you've continuously seemed to have been able to do that throughout your career, like with um with your next film after that. Um, uh, it's I can never pronounce it a, a, a lot. Um, Elysium. 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 Uh, thank you. Elysium. Yeah. Uh, what was it like jumping from District Nine to a, a, basically a big studio movie with big movie stars and you know all that? Yeah, it was interesting. I mean, you know, again, Elysium at its core is the the core topics that it's talking about are not. Mm -hmm completely normal inside the genre that it was being presented as mm -hmm. so it was also unusual and i mean that's another film that like it could have could have worked or not works or you know you you again you just you just don't know if you're doing a chappies even more it's like each one of them was like slightly more unpredictable in the way that they would be received mm -hmm. um but uh no elysium you know people often ask me about about be, because now I've spent a bunch of time essentially making YouTube videos with old studios <laughs> and demonic is a self-funded paranormal activity. And so it's like, well, what's, what's it like, you know, what, what is the difference between the high budget stuff and the low budget stuff? And what's really interesting is day to day stuff doesn't actually feel that different to me. The day to day shooting of it is not different, which is interesting because maybe it's like you're facing the same problems and you're facing the same, you know, thought processes about how to deal with things. But um, it, it's only really on a theoretical level. Like if this, if this endeavor doesn't do well, you know, will it make it harder to get other things like this greenlit? Um, okay. It's sort of bigger theoretical questions like that, because working with, working with Hugh Jackman or, or Matt or something, you know, or Jody or, or Sigourney, it's like, it's you, they're just very cool actors to work with that are very easy to work with. It's it's not, again, it's not like a radically different situation. So, yeah, it's more it's more on the theoretical side than the practical side. I would say the differences. Now, on uh, you know, as a director, there's always that moment on set, uh, at least on, on all the projects I've ever worked on, where you feel like. The world is this is the world's gonna swallow me up this is like I, I, everything's going wrong i'm losing the light the actor's mm. not working the the practical effects isn't working you're already giggling because <laughs> you're already going through it but so what was on either <laughs> on either district nine or chappie or elysium which was the day that sticks out in your head is like the like like this whole thing is going to come crashing down around me and what did you learn from it well, I mean, it, in a way, you're asking two questions in one question. Like, are you when you say the whole thing is going to come crashing down around me? One way to look at that is, 
is this day just sucks and it's incredibly difficult to make this day. But another way to look at it is, is I'm completely fucked and the entire movie is a piece of shit. Like which which one do you mean? Oh, like, that's yeah. You're you're absolutely right because it could be like this is just a really bad day, or yeah. well, and then generally, like Martin Scorsese says, is like if you don't look at your first cut and think it's absolute crap, you've done something wrong. There <laughs> <So> is. <laughs> so I guess it would be like the day. The I think it's a combination. So it's a combination of like maybe it's been getting a couple of days have been bad and other things have been going off <laughs> and it just pops on this day and you're just like. Oh my god! Am I going to get this movie finished? Is is the I mean, story? I, being I told? definitely, I definitely remember a lot of incidences of just difficult shooting days, but they're they're always sort of buffeted by the feeling that you could make up for it the next day. Like I never, I never totally felt like I had a lost in La Mancha kind of situation. <laughs> <laughs> what a great movie! <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, but uh, but I mean, like one of them was in Elysium when we were shooting in uh, in in the area where. Carlisle's ship crashes, the billionaire's Bugatti crashes in the garbage dump, and they basically heist the information out of him. Mm -hmm. um, that was the second biggest garbage dump in the world, and it was a real garbage dump in Mexico City. And um, the top layer of soil was you know, completely toxic because of all of the garbage, and so production had to scrape the whole gar top of the garbage oh. dump. Like the sand, it's sort of like the Utah salt flats. Mm -hmm. We had to remove that and then put in fresh... Um, you know, uh, art department soil that looked similar, similar. So in that environment, there were, there were, we were using a lot of helicopters too. And there were, there were days there that were just, uh, those were probably the hardest shooting days. I think just in terms of how rancid the environment was, how hard some of the shots were that we were trying to do, how we were running out of light. Um, yeah. Yeah, it was th those were those were consciously memorable as being just really difficult for me. And did you at, at, at those on those days? Did you like why did I come up with why did I why is there a scene in this garbage dump? Yeah. And I've written this somewhere else. Yeah, I think I do think that often. <laughs> but I, I would also say that pretty much all of District Nine felt that way. Right. Uh, it sense. was District Nine was by far the most difficult shoot, um, and. You know, there, there's this thing that happens sometimes where, where art and reality kind of line up in a way that, that there's some serendipitous alignment with the universe. Uh, that, I mean, in in the in the story, District Nine is a flip digit where District Six in South Africa has its own real history. It's in the Cape. It's not. It's not by Johannesburg, but. It was a forced eviction under apartheid where uh, this in, uh, this entire community was forced to relocate. The government just drew a circle around it and said, like, this is no longer where you will be living. And they moved everybody out of it. And so the District 6 relocation is quite quite a well-known thing. And, and so the 9 is a play on the 6 just being rotated. So that was a way to, to uh, from a plot engine device, to say that that as as the as the story engine in terms of plot we will say that this entire group of aliens needs to be forcibly evicted and relocated mm -hmm. and then the 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 uh character and emotional storylines can intersect with that with that plot storyline so we needed to find an area that looked like um like a south african shanty town that preferably was, was real because we couldn't afford to build something at the scale that I wanted mm -hmm. um, and that we would then you know have ownership over and we could we could uh, move all of these these aliens out of this area in the story so in real life in uh, southern Johannesburg in Soweto there's an area called clip town which is where we shot and we ended up shooting there because the the government, although this is the ANC government, so it's it's Mandela's government, even though he, mm. he wasn't around at this point, uh, was forcibly relocating uh, thousands of residents of this part of Cliptown to somewhere else. Unlike apartheid, it wasn't a racially based thing, and it was more about there's these government funded houses called RDP housing, which are built by the government and, you know, have proper plumbing and, and they're right. theoretically much better for the residents than living in, in tin shacks that, that are, you know, true poverty, but still a lot of people didn't want to go because they're from here. I mean, obviously it's like the government comes in and just moves you, maybe the house is better, but you it's, it should be your choice whether or not you're you know being moved. So 
they were moved out of this area, like forcibly by the government. So this event that I had based the the plot structure on of was was occurring in real life in a way that was happening in front of us, and we were moving into these shacks that were left over by the residents that were moved out. So that's pretty that's pretty crazy, you know, for that for that level mm-hmm. of of um, a, I don't know whether it's alignment or, you know, I mean, it's not misfortune because it was good for the movie, but it was bad for the people being moved out. I think. Uh, but how how bizarre is that? So anyway, the point is we had, you know, 50 or 60 vehicles that would go into this particular area, which was super rough um, every day for the duration of shooting. And that's where we were based. And it was it was uh, that, that's why I say it was just it was just really difficult on, on multiple levels shooting that film. I mean, and psychologically, I guess I was. You know, maybe the crew didn't feel it as much as I was because there was a bunch of different things. But I th- the crew would agree that it was pretty tough, right? And 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 it's also your first feature, and you know, you're. I mean, you're taking mm-hmm. you're taking a big swing of bat on your first feature mm-hmm. here. I mean, if this doesn't go well, chances of you getting the second feature, and I'm sure that was weighing on you yeah. as well. And I think a lot of filmmakers listening. You know, I don't know. I don't know about that. I don't know. I, I, the statement is true. If this yeah. doesn't go well, you may have trouble in future. That is a true statement. Yeah. Whether it's weighing on me, I would say I don't think it's weighing on me. I just don't things, really but... give a shit like that way. I don't care. Like, yeah, I never, ever have cared. That makes that makes all the sense if, in the if world. If that was the case, I wouldn't <laughs> spend four years making YouTube videos and then shooting Demonic as a self-funded film. You know what I mean? I just don't <laughs> care. It's like, I don't care. And that is why uh, your films are the way they are, man, because you just don't mm-hmm. give a shit in, that, in a, that, the best way possible with that statement and uh, mm-hmm. you're a brave filmmaker and there are a lot of filmmakers who aren't brave that they go down the safe route and you definitely are like nope I'm gonna go down mm-hmm. the road that makes me feel the way I want to feel and yeah. tell the stories I want to tell which brings me to Chappie <laughs> for good or bad yeah yeah, <laughs> exactly <laughs> for good or bad now which brings me to Chappie which I absolutely love Chappie man it has so much heart in it man how did you come up with Chappie you know I think Chappie is a Chappie may be the weirdest of all of them um but it, it was a combination of I'm really interested in in Gnostic ideas and Gnosticism in general, which kind of dovetails a little bit into pessimistic philosophy. Mm-hmm. But there's this idea in Gnosticism that that by existing in the physical world, like if your soul, there's there's a there's a Descartes dualism to to uh, to Gnosticism, where mm-hmm. with dualism, obviously you're saying there is the immaterial, which is the soul, and then there is the material, which is the physical body in the mm-hmm. physical world. Mm-hmm. So this immaterial, you know, non-dimensional thing is injected. It it it, it innervates the the material body. And when the material body dies, the soul leaves again, right? And it may be reincarnated. I mean, every, everyone has a, has a different religious point of view or not a non-religious point of view of, of what all of this means. Mm-hmm. But the Gnostic point of view is that immaterial being and immateriality is true and is good. So there, the, the soul, prior to being infused into a physical body, is pure and mm-hmm. it is correct and the act of of physicalizing it just the nature of of basically of birthing into the world is already an act of defilement so the physical world is actually it's actually a jail it's like a meat mm-hmm. prison that's mm-hmm. here to break you right it's mm-hmm. and this yeah. is why it, do, it dovetails into pessimistic philosophy because there's a lot of schopenhauer and spinoza and gurdjieff and you know uh all of them talk, talk about these similar ideas that the world will just kind of break you and physical reality is no good. So, so the movie is not about AI. The movie was using a robot to, to try to put forward the idea of that over time, the physical reality will corrupt you. Okay. And then it was also, uh, it was also meant to be presented in a totally absurd tone so these massive philosophical concepts were meant to be presented as like bubblegum pop fucking insanity that looks that is irreverent and looks like it should never be talking about these topics and Dion Fuert as a South African rap group seemed like a really interesting way to say that like none of this is serious it's all fun and crazy um, but actually if you look more deeply it is serious 
So on the surface level, it looks like a Dion Foot music video, and then on the deeper level, you know, it's 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 meant to put forward these huge ideas of of these existential questions. That's what the goal was, and I don't know really what order that took in the way that it was um, conceived, uh, but it, that's kind of what happened. And then I think one of the main reasons that the audience didn't didn't click with it was that was the exact thing that I was trying to do, which is that why are these two tonal things existing in the same movie? Like either it's serious and it should just be serious or it's like totally, you know, not serious, which is it. Mm. And that schizophrenic nature is what I love. Even though perhaps it's a bit too, you know, but too out there. Bit too out there for for normal for normal people mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, to accept as far as their entertainment is concerned. Yeah. No, I love that it challenges you, and I love that kind of erratic nature of the film. I I, I was a, when I saw it, I was a very big fan of it. And again, it was just like I always wondered about how you were getting this, how you were getting the puck through. <laughs> like I was always wondering, like man, how is he, how is he huh. taking these swings with these budgets? And that's the thing is like you know. There's, there's there's a handful of filmmakers out there who do take some big swings at bat, and Nick like, Nolan is taking huge swings at bat with massive mm -hmm. budgets, and there's very few guys like him in the world. Um, but you do it as well with your projects. Uh, I always just found it fascinating how you were able to do mm -hmm. that. So, and when I saw Chappie, I was like, "How the hell did he get this thing made? Like, it, mm -hmm. it's amazing. But how did he get yeah, it?" Yeah, I, I, I kind <laughs> of agree with you. Like looking back on it, like I saw it, I saw it, uh, you know, six or eight months ago or something, and I was like, "How in the fuck did this get financed?" <laughs> like, <laughs> What? what is going on? Yeah. <laughs> Just makes me more stoked that it's out there. <laughs> so wait a minute. So I, I got this one made. Maybe I can get another. <laughs> maybe, yeah. I can, maybe I can get another one. Make it take another swing. <laughs> Which And then I saw, uh, you know, a, like four years ago when you came out with Oat Studios. Like, mm -hmm. how did that whole thing, because again, now you're just like, you know what, screw it, I'm going to YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> Which of course was yeah. what most studio, <laughs> most, you know, big directors or, or you know, successful directors do is they go, I'm just gonna make shorts on, on YouTube. <laughs> yeah. How did that whole, how did the whole concept of Oat Studios and what you're doing with Oat Studios come to be? Um, well, it was initially not meant to be uh, YouTube, it was meant to be Steam, actually. Oh, okay. um, yeah. And because Steam is a way to monetize it, if you you know eventually you could you could start charging for things, um, but but uh, video on Steam went through some some changes and stuff, and it may not be the best uh, the best destination for Oats. So in the process of trying to reconfigure it and figure out what would be another version of Steam, uh, we just put everything that we had made onto YouTube because it was going to be free initially, regardless, no matter what we did, it was going to be free. Um, and so now I'm I'm pretty involved in in figuring out a different way to release another batch of stuff that that later could, not being monetized is the wrong way to describe it, but figuring out a financial model to continue to release stuff like it. Right. So that's that's what I'm I'm busy figuring out, and it should be separate from Hollywood. You know, it shouldn't it shouldn't be connected to Hollywood. It should it's meant to act almost more like a video game company really than anything that would be in Hollywood. And and what I mean by video game company or an animation studio actually would be another way to think of it. Mm -hmm. Because because physical production is just a bunch of nomads that are brought together. They're they're coagulated for one production and then they disseminate back into the wild. And that configuration would never really occur that way ever again. Mm -hmm. And if you look at Pixar or you look at a lot of game studios, that isn't the case, right? These 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 are artists that are working under one roof for many years on many different uh, projects. So I wanted Oats to be a live action version of that, where everyone from production design to costume to visual effects, like everything would be under one, one, one roof and it would make everything from start to finish. Um, so it, it was just, it was just a, a theoretical film studio concept that I'm still very drawn to. And I want to continue to try to figure out. Now, um, it, you, because you're always on kind of like the leading, you know, the bleeding edge of technology with a lot of the stuff that you do. Is there any filmmaking technology or technology that you see in the in the horizon that you are hoping comes to be? Like, they're like, oh man, if I could just have this. It's like what they're doing with the Mandalorian and, and the volume there and uh, all that kind of stuff. I know that's, but is there anything else that is coming no. up? No, you're good right now? No, I, I don't think so. I mean, 
I, I think all of the tools that filmmakers need have been there for a long time. You know, uh, it's more just a case now of like ease of use, maybe or something, something that makes it easier. You know, because um, mm-hmm. film making films is very difficult. <laughs> it's super, super difficult. But um, yeah, no, there's, there's. I don't really look at it that way. It's you know the 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 volumetric capture that we used in Demonic was something that I had sort of earmarked for for one of the Oates Studios film, short films, right? It was like, that. that's what I thought I was doing with it. Um, and Oates is a perfect avenue to look at stuff like that, where it's like, well, let's just use this wacky technology, or yeah, let's do this. Or like, we made a puppet show that we haven't released. But it's like, let's just make a puppet show. It doesn't have to be about technology. It's just about like interesting things that are maybe stuff I haven't done before. So... Volumetric capture was something that I was becoming increasingly more interested in um, right up until the pandemic, where prior to COVID-19, I I thought that the next film that I would do would be in a, in a sort of like, you know, a chappy-ish budget range. Mm-hmm. And and then I would have separately, I would have this old studios um, creative stuff that I was doing. So let's use the experimental volumetric capture in something at oats which is where it should be and then we can fuck around with it and put it on youtube so we started speaking to metastage in los angeles uh who was really helpful and super cool they're they're a volumetric capture studio and i would speak to them about like well how would you do this and how does this work and you know uh just because i was obsessed with with volumetric capture and i knew what that what the three-dimensional outcome of that would would look like and and what it would be like to you to play with it in, in 3D and figure out stuff. So when the pandemic happened, it was like, well, instead of doing an Oats Studios thing that we release online, why don't we make something that's more like paranormal activity? Just scale it up to like, you know, one and a half hours. And and we can use some of the stuff that we were thinking about, like volumetric capture. So Demonic is also an unusual film because this stuff that normally wouldn't have been in it in a feature sense just kind of came to be because there was an you know a good gap of time and and a way to experiment with it so but in answer to your question though i don't sit around going like what technology could i use it's it's more a case of one half of my brain kind of looking at just being interested in stuff that is coming out and going oh that would be fun to play with like that would be interesting oh that would be a cool look you know um that could that could be interesting in, in some story sense and then uh the other the other part is like if you have a pre-existing idea or a script then then does any of this make sense in it or is it worth changing something in it to incorporate these ideas and like often it may not be you know it could just be the story the story is story first and then look look in reverse demonic is weird because it happened the other way around so yeah, it's so- almost like because it was birthed out of this reverse engineered way of coming to be so yeah so tell me a little bit about demonic and how it how that actually got all put together and you shot during the pandemic and what that whole process is like Mm. well i mean each one of the shorts on the bigger shorts like if you look at something like zygote Mm -hmm. those are like they're over two million dollars right like each of them so um demonic is under two million so it was like we, we we can we can make another short or because there seems to be a bigger chunk of time now, we could make something that's maybe more like paranormal activity. Paranormal activity was always my my reference point. Like I loved how, you know, the filmmakers just shot something that they just shot in their own house, and you know, the the actors were the ones operating the camera. It just felt like a like a a creative, interesting way to get a visceral response from the audience at a very low budget number. So. Um, it was like because the pandemic has has allowed for this gap in time where like normal production is just on hold and it was right at the point that i wanted to go back into hollywood and start making stuff Mm -hmm. um in in a feature sense then i i I just thought like well why not make a feature just at this lower budget level and we'll use the same approach that we use with a lot of the oat stuff and then use some of this weird technology that we want to play with so that's basically what happened so we, you know, it was it was a case of reverse engineering what we had access to, like the locations and, right. um, yeah, and then just playing in that sandbox, which is w- what happened. So yeah, so it, very much like paranormal activity, like or El Mariachi is like, what do I have? I have a Mexican town. Mm. I have some guns. I have a turtle. I have a, a mariachi case. You were like, okay, I have a volume. Yeah. I have volume. So your tools just yeah. happened. You were just yeah. reverse engineering based on the tool set that you had. 
Yeah, exactly. El Mariachi is an interesting reference point. Like, no one's brought that up, and I haven't thought about that, but it's true, actually. I should I should go and watch that. Yeah, Mariachi is... I mean, I mean I've seen it, but I haven't seen it recently. Like, yeah, yeah, I, know, I know the history of it. Right, exactly. It's just kind of like that backing into a story based on the stuff that you have, and Paranormal did that, and... I think mm. even Blair Witch, to a certain extent, did that as well. Mm. But Mariachi was specific. Like, he wrote the script around, like, what I have a bottle. Great, yeah. that bottle's in the scene. <laughs> yeah, it's exactly – that was exactly what happened. I mean, that's, that's pretty much, like, exactly how it was, it, was, it was conceived, which is even more constrain, – way more constraining than the oat stuff, actually. Because the oat stuff was still a relatively normal process in terms of just think up any idea. Right. And then let's figure out how to execute it. This this was because it was a longer running time. It was like, you know, you're you're taking the smaller amount of money over a longer period of time. You can't just make up whatever you want. So what what do you have access to around here? And originally, I was going to film it in my own house. I mean, that's not what ended up happening. But in the initial idea was let's just film it in my place. So, and this is the thing that I find fascinating about your career. You've worked on, you know, big studio projects. But very few directors who work on big studio projects will go all the way back down to the indie level and do something as insane as, I'm going to go shoot in my house. <laughs> that's, that's extreme bravery. Um, or you just don't care, which is what you've stated many times. You're like, I'm just going to do what I want to do. Yeah, I mean, I think... You know, you, yeah, it's, it's, it's just a personal preference thing, maybe. Like, I... I really do feel I don't like being told what I have to do, and I don't I don't like there being any expectation on what I'm meant to do. I want to just do what I want to do, and uh, if if I want to shoot something that's like really low budget, then I should be allowed to go and do that, you know. And yeah, I, I'm curious to see. I mean, the next film that I want to do should feel it it requires quite a lot of resources, I think, because it has some real scope to it, like has some serious scope to it. So it'll probably feel um, it'll probably feel a, a lot bigger than what I've been doing lately. Are you But I mean that's because I want to do it. It's because I had an idea that I I love the idea behind it. So are you are you going to go back to this kind of demonic style of filmmaking again? Cuz it's, it's so free. I mean, it's so free yeah. as an artist. You just like let's just go. I don't have to worry about anything. I don't have to go f you just go and do yeah no it's definitely possible i mean it's like yeah you know it's it's completely possible i mean the thing that i would say is more uh, uh, almost more certain in a way is more is more of the oats kind of stuff mm -hmm. that that is that is almost certainly going to happen uh the features at the lower budget level it's like sure if there's something cool like i'll, I'll probably do it so but you're the, the oats stuff is a real goal Got it. So you, so what you're saying is you want to be a YouTuber for the rest of your life is what you're saying. <laughs> no, <'cause, laughs> I'm joking. No, because remember, remember I was saying it wouldn't be, uh, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be YouTube. Like it was Steam. It was Steam initially. I know. I'm joking. I, I'm joking. It, actually, it could. There's a possibility it could be YouTube. That'd be yeah. that'd be interesting. But I, I mean, again, like there's a lot of there's a lot of creativity happening with YouTubers that, oh, that like yeah. I I don't necessarily see. I, happening at the same level and hollywood is so it's so stilted i mean there are there are a handful of directors that are doing super interesting stuff but for the most part it's that's not the feeling that i get the feeling i get in general is just highly homogenized like least the what is the least offensive thing that we can do that checks these boxes of whatever particular particular genre that it's in like i'm not overly stimulated by stuff that i'm seeing Unless it's from a handful of like directors that are that are you know pretty awesome, so the YouTubers on the other hand just fucking do whatever they want, and it's like that feels much I don't, you know much more interesting to me. Like they're not making feature films, but they're they're doing what they want to do, and and I really enjoy that. And anytime you can give an artist free reign and some resources to do whatever they want to do, it's, your cool stuff's going to come out. And you've been able to build that world for yourself in a in a very large way. So I applaud you as a fellow artist that you have been able to do that for you. So, and that you are just brave beyond compare. You just, don't, you just don't give a crap. And that's what's so wonderful about it because the best filmmakers in the world are the ones who just – did you hear like what Coppola's doing now? Yeah, I just read that, about that. That's insane. He's like, how old is he yeah. now? He's like – I'm just going to throw $100 million. <laughs> I'm going to write a check for $100 million yeah. because of all that, wine, awesome. all that wine money I've been making over the last yeah. decade. 
and I'm just going to make a movie because I'm crazy. He, he's been destroying it in the wine industry. So he's going <laughs> to he's, been he's gonna like he's been crushing it. That over. No, no pun intended. He's been crushing. Yeah, it. yeah. <laughs> uh, That's pretty I, cool, though. I mean, it's definitely like it's refreshing to see that. Exactly. And if anyone's ever seen Hearts of Darkness, uh, you understand uh, the documentary about Apocalypse Now. You mm. just know he's as insane as they come. Um, yeah. And he's the, he's the originating one of the originating insane guys. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Coppola is very cool. American zoetrope. You know, the whole the whole thing is pretty amazing. The whole thing that he did. Yeah. Well, he, he tried to do multiple times and and has able, been able to pull off with American zoetrope is is uh, is interesting. Um, now, I have to ask you a question. Is there any piece of advice that you would give you you wish you would have gotten or you would be able to give yourself your younger self? If you can go back, is there anything? Jesus, that's an interesting question. I mean, I, it would probably be something along the lines of just sticking to what you believe in. Like, don't let people knock you off the rails that you're that you're on. You know, like really just double down and and completely commit to what you believe in, and don't let people talk you out of things. It would probably be something along those lines. That's a great piece of advice because you're right. People are always always for good intentions or bad intentions they're always trying to either work you or push you and, and tug you in different directions and director has to stand firm sometimes yeah i think that would you know that would be i mean i'm i'm relatively like that but i i could be more I could be more like that and i think if i was younger it would have it would have been something that probably would have been like quite helpful now um what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn whether in the film industry or in life I mean, I don't know whether I have even learned this, but one thing that I'm aware of now as I get older is regardless of how fucked up things become <laughs> or how, how <laughs> just how like, you know, how, how terrible it, things may appear uh, to be, or maybe a different way of describing it is regardless of the level of pressure that you are under, mm -hmm. um, always just try to try to not let that infect the way that you treat other people and yeah. try, try to always have a sense of um, politeness or dealing with other people in a way that you're not bringing your bullshit into the, into the situation. I don't know if that makes sense or not. I, mm -hmm. it, it's, it, yeah, it's something along those lines that I'm more aware of uh, lately that, that I, that I'm trying to do. You know, you seem very fearless when you do all of the work that you've been doing over the course of your career. Is there a moment where you were deathly afraid and you had to break through that fear to get a project done or to do something that was really testing you as a writer or director? You know, when the films aren't received well, it's difficult because it makes you question who you're making the films for. Hmm. That's probably the closest I've come to just it just makes you question things and right. um maybe maybe that's the closest when when i'm i'm pretty good at when i'm making stuff to just make it the way that i want to make it like the way the way that i look at it is like we were talking about before if you're doing a bunch of generic stuff you can be highly predictable with the outcome right mm -hmm. you can be you can be rel you you can be relatively assured in the way that the film will be received if you do certain things the more the more you venture away from that you're you're venturing into a place where the film could be a massive failure and it could be a massive success and it could could be somewhere in the middle but it but what is definitely happening is that you're venturing into the world of unpredictable and 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 that there is no there, there's there is no way to know how the audience is going to take it so over the course of my career i would prefer to have made even if i make a bunch of films that really don't work with audiences I, there will be some in there that massively do work and the only way to discover which those are is to continue to like hold the course and, and make stuff that, you know, you just feel like you believe in. Right. Um, so there's, there's something in that approach that I think is quite mentally challenging and quite difficult, but that, that also feels truthful. Um, so yeah, it would be somewhere in there that I think. Yeah, and then you and you basically live in that place with every project you do. Essentially, you as you've been telling me, every single feature that you've yeah. done, not as much with the oat stuff. Maybe I shouldn't do that so much. Like I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what are three of your favorite films, man, of all time? 
Well, one right at the absolute top would be Doctor Strange Love. <laughs> awesome. And uh, yeah, I think I think Strange Love is is very extremely applicable to me in the sense that there's this this dark satire about you know it's it's humorous satire about these these incredibly dark concepts that that lie at the core of human nature um so strange love would be like way up there on the list um the matrix may be like almost i don't know number two like the matrix is is the matrix is a huge deal to me because it's it's philosophical Mm -hmm. and it's just pure popcorn entertainment it's both things wrapped up in the most amazing way right uh so the, the matrix would be you know would be there um and I guess probably potentially Alien. Like oh, if I'm talking about three films. I mean, obviously that list changes, but like, yeah, Alien would probably be in there too. Because yeah. Alien is is all of these other elements. Like the, the, the it's operating on a psychological level that is very interesting, and then it has all of the design elements. It has the straightforward science fiction elements. You know, the way that it's shot. There's just a yeah, it's just another home run. So all three of those movies are something on the front, uh, on the surface, but then mm. they have a dig that well goes really deep. Yeah. Uh, all three of those films do. I mean, obviously there's no fighting in the war room. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, but The Matrix, I mean, when I remember seeing The Matrix when it came out in 99, I saw it four times in the theater. Like, yeah, same. Gonna, same. I, mean, I, I, was just, just, I was just talking to a friend of mine about that. Um, uh, and yeah, we thought it was like five times. It's insane. Uh, it, was it, was, insane. it was the same thing. He actually went. He actually went on to do the VFX on the next two, on uh, two and three, because you know, like, he, yeah, we, he we needed to be just, a part of it. He wanted to yeah. just jump on it. And that was yeah. the thing. Is like when that movie came out, you're just like, for people that weren't around at that time, you have to understand there was just like a like an atom bomb going off in mm. in, in film. It just changed yeah. the trajectory of. I think there was yeah. there's certain movies that just change the trajectory of cinema, and that's just one of them. Like how yeah. how could you stick a popcorn movie with so much immense philosophical conversations and themes that, on mm. the surface, most people don't even get. But if but for other people, it, you can get it at multiple layers, and that's like Kubrick's work. I mean, Kubrick, you just keep seeing layers and layers mm-hmm. and layers, and it ages very well. Even that film mm-hmm. ages extremely well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the Matrix is is pretty incredible. Um, wh- how old are you? I'm 47. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I I was I, th- I would have been I think I was 19 when it came out. It was exactly at the point that I realized I could work in f- that. I, well, I was working in film as an animator, but I mean that I could direct movies. Right. So it was uh, it was like ground shattering for me that movie. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, yeah. Those, there's certain movies that hit you at certain points in your life, and that was definitely one for me. I was 24, I think, at that point. Yeah. Uh, and it just, just, just like afterwards, you're just like Jesus Christ. Um, yeah. Now, where can people see Demonic Man, and and uh, when is it coming out? Uh, well, it was out on August 20th uh, in li- very limited theatrical run. And now it's just uh, video on demand. Is it on? Is it available right now on video on demand? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So I will definitely put the links in the show notes for everybody to definitely cool. check out uh, your latest, man. You know what? Another, another. I mean, this isn't. It's not the same in terms of depth, but it came out. I think a year after the Matrix was uh, that I just loved. I, went, I saw it multiple times. Was Gladiator. Oh, I mean, and it's like I mean, oh, Jesus, I just the way right the way <laughs> the way Ridley shoots stuff. You know, like it's it's. I, I I'm 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 such a fan of his just because of the variety of stuff that he does, but also. It, it it feels like it's one of his films, and Gladiator very much feels like it has this kind of this classic Ridley Scott feel to it that I just love. I mean, you can see. I mean, you're looking at like <laughs> Alien, then Blade Runner, Thelma and Louise, yeah. <laughs> Gladiator. Yeah. You're, like you're just like oh, and the the movie he did with uh, Russell and the in the French and in, in the uh, in France. A good uh, a good year. Okay, a good year, which I love as yeah. well. Like it's so all over the place like he has yeah. so many different things but you know you know what one of my favorite films is that he's done and and it's a movie that i love in general but it's it's probably because i love cormac mccarthy mm-hmm. and i feel like it was just not at all given a fair a fair shake was uh the counselor yeah i i actually really like the counselor i like how 
dark and and sort of nihilistic it is. Uh, I, I love it, and I love that it was Cormac McCarthy's only feature script that he's written. Um, I, I love that movie, but you know, it's a lot of people haven't seen it. It's, it's uh, just uh, just out of curiosity. Who are the directors now who are inspiring you? Who are working? Like who are like you know the top three or five guys or gals out there just going like they're nailing it, man. And I, I just I'm I'm first 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 in line when something comes mm-hmm. out. Well, Ridley Ridley would be up there. Um, mm-hmm. James yeah. Cameron would be like you know the the next avatars. Cameron yeah. I love. Um, oh, Fincher. Finch, yeah, and, that, and, that, and Nolan. I love Nolan stuff. I love the dark, the Dark Knight. Is, the 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 Dark Knight trilogy is some of my favorite films. I love those movies. Yeah, uh, and also again, they're supposed to be popcorn movies, but they have mm. a lot of conversation going on underneath it. Yeah, so. uh, Neil, man, it's been a pleasure talking to you, brother. It really has. Um, thank you so yeah, much for you. not only being on the show, man, for fighting the good fight out there, taking those big swings at Batman. We really appreciate what you do, man. So keep up the good work, brother. Okay.